If you were going to pick somewhere to re-civilize and re-Christianize Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire, Ireland would probably have been the last place you looked. It was remote, dark, dangerous, and for good or ill, almost completely isolated. The sacking of Rome, the descent of Pax Romana into lawlessness, the destruction of centuries of learning, the precarious future of a church that had only recently been established, the ripple effects of these major events barely reached these shores. Not that that made things better, like, at all. Ireland simply remained what it had been for centuries, the nightmarish home of bloodthirsty druids, the servants of demon gods who reveled in human sacrifice. Well, let's put it this way. The three most powerful gods in the Celtic pantheon, each of these required human sacrifices. Tyrannus, most famously, Julius Caesar talks about how prisoners of war were burned alive in wicker cages. That was the Tyrannus. Uh, Essus, the chieftain, um, did sacrifice by, let's see, yeah, hanging, garroting, uh, or impaling. And you had Teotatus, who drowned his victims. It was into this nation, at a time of global crisis, that there arrived a British Christian named Patricius or Patrick as we know him today. He had been here before as a slave, captured by pirates and forced to work as a shepherd for a druid lord in Uli to the northeast of the island. Having made a miraculous escape back to his homeland of Britain, once there Patrick had a dream. He was visited by a Celt carrying a letter entitled Vox Hiberniae, the voice of the Irish. And as the man read, Patrick heard the sound of a mass of Irish voices crying out, We ask you, holy boy, to come and walk among us again. And so it was that Patrick found himself returning to Ireland, not as a slave, but this time as an evangelistic conqueror, coming to win this last outcrop of rock and mud at the edge of the world for Christ. Now you have to recognise a couple of things about this mission. Firstly, these Druids, as we've said, they weren't a particularly friendly bunch. But secondly, Patrick's methods of reaching them, well, they weren't exactly sort of Joel Osteen levels of seeker sensitivity. The Feast of Beltane was a big deal in Ireland. Every year the nation would extinguish its fires for a day and no one was permitted to light them until the High King had lit his ceremonial flame on the summit of the Hill of Tara. Patrick's first action in Ireland was to position himself on the Hill of Slane, which is slightly higher, clearly visible, about 10 miles away across the valley. And after giving it careful consideration, he decided that it would be the perfect time to light his own Paschal bonfire. Seeing this, the High King Leary exclaimed, If we do not extinguish this flame, it will sweep all over Ireland. He sent troops of men to arrest Patrick, but every time Patrick quoted Psalm 68 verse 1, May God arise and his enemies be scattered, and the soldiers who came to arrest him fell on their face. Apparently this happened seven times. The High King came and knelt before Patrick and opened the entire island up for his preaching, after which followed one of the greatest cultural transformations ever in any country. Druid Lord after Druid Lord was challenged and defeated. 100,000 people came to faith. And all of this permanently and drastically changed Ireland in a single generation. I kind of view it this way. It's like Christianity and with it Western civilization, right as it was sort of falling apart everywhere else, found a new safe haven outside of the mainstream. This new, completely unexpected place became totally Christianized almost overnight. Now, most people end the story there. Ireland is saved three cheers, pint of Guinness, hooray, right? But that's only half the story. 
See, the other half is that it's from this place, which is still a remote, obscure island on the edge of things, that Christianity, and with it Western civilization, would launch something of a counterattack back into Europe. And that all starts with, well, those former Druids. Basically, the Druids were the repository of all the knowledge of the culture. You had to know history, you had to know law, you had to know um, certainly uh, religion, uh, the legends and myths, the rituals. Uh, you had to learn magic, you had to learn how to use your voice to imitate all kinds of natural sounds ranging from thunder to bird calls. You had to learn poetry, you know, on and on and on. You, you were the one who held the entire culture in your mind because they didn't write anything down. So this sort of intellectual and spiritual devotion, this is what people expected of their religious leaders, which in this new Christianized world were the Irish monks. Irish monks operated completely differently to monks in the rest of the world. They were not, as many other monks are, running away from things to seek a life of quiet contemplation and prayer. The Irish ones, they were pretty much the exact opposite. They were embedded in the clan system. They were involved in communities. They were often married. They were not under the control of the Roman church. They sat very much outside it. And their monasteries, well, they were basically a mix of a church and a school and a university and a media centre and a business workshop, pretty much all in one. In the generation after Patrick, there were 12 figures who came to prominence and are now referred to as the 12 Apostles of Ireland. One of these guys was called Kieran. The story goes that he was in class one day and having only memorised half of the Gospel of Matthew, which I admit is pretty weak sauce, his classmates started to mock him and call him Kieran Half Matthew. But his teacher said, no, call him Kieran Half Ireland, for he shall win half the island and the rest will be left to us. And this declaration proved powerfully true. One day when he was on the island of Arran with his friend, they both received the same vision of a fruitful tree by the banks of the river. His friend said to him, The tree is you. All Ireland will be sheltered by the grace that is in you, and many people will be nourished by your fasting and prayers. Go in God's name to the centre of Ireland and establish your community on the banks of a river. Now you have to understand that Ireland at this time was boggy and forested. It was a tough place to travel. People used rivers as a way to get around and also these things called eskers, which are basically just ridges that are raised up a little bit higher than the surrounding bogland, making them natural roads. There's a point called Clon McNoise, where the river Shannon, which runs north to south, intersects with the Esker Riada, which is the main Esker in the country that runs from east to west. And it was at this major junction on the banks of this river that Kieran started his monastery. And, oh yeah, it's also right in the middle of Ireland, as if he was making a declaration that the entire place belonged to Jesus. And it was to places like Clon McNoise that people flocked in their thousands, not just from Ireland, but from across Europe. Believers, bishops and scholars travelled there for training, often bringing with them the great works of antiquity. And these were not merely preserved, they were copied, they were transcribed and they were sent back into Europe to recover what was lost. A couple of centuries later, when Charlemagne leads the first medieval renaissance, he employs a monk named Alcuin to transform education across the empire, which he absolutely does. Alcuin was trained at Clon McNoise. And not only did Ireland become a hub to which people came for training and education, it also became a place from which people were sent into the ruins of the former Roman Empire to take Christianity back. One of my favourite stories is that of Conkill, or Columba as he's often known. He was a monk who got in trouble for illegally copying someone else's copy of the Psalms. And when the king said, well, that actually belongs to the original owner, he didn't take it well. No, instead he, you know, went to war with the king and 3,000 people died. Pretty strange behaviour for a monk, if you ask me. 
The story continues that he was exiled and forbidden to return to Ireland until he had seen as many people converted as died during the battle. So he sails to Iona, the first Scottish island from which you cannot see the shores of Ireland. What's amazing though is that in spite of his history, this works. This, let's say, intense guy sees similar scenes in Scotland as what St. Patrick saw in Ireland. The entire nation, this unreached tribe known as the Picts, who again the Romans did not conquer, were radically converted. A century or so later, you've got Columbanus. Columbanus was trained at a monastery in Bangor, which held a prayer meeting that lasted for, I don't know, about 250 years. Two centuries of monks taking shifts for 24-7 prayer. It was so impactful that it has changed the name of the local forest even to this day. But Columbanus is a piece of work in the best possible sense. He gets sent out on his peregrinatio, his mission, and ends up preaching his way across France and Switzerland and northern Italy as we would know them today. He upset all the established church leaders who refused to go anywhere as rough and as wild as he would. He took on the ungodly rulers of the nations. He reprimanded the corrupt leadership in the church. He assailed the Aryan heretics and he even chastised the Bishop of Rome for his weak leadership. In the process, he set up over 100 monasteries, which ended up being the most important educational centers in the whole of Europe. We could go on and on and on about how these men swept across Europe from the west to the east, bringing with them Christianity and learning and education and piety into a place which had once been its stronghold. Ireland was the hub of this movement. It was not just a place that became Christian. It wasn't even just a center for Christianity. It was a launching pad for re-establishing the faith in the Western world. As Thomas Cahill puts it, monks began to set off in every direction, bent on glorious and heroic exile for the sake of Christ. They were warrior monks, of course, and certainly not afraid of whatever monsters they might meet. Some went north, like Conkill. Others went northwest, like Brendan the Navigator, visiting Iceland, Greenland, and North America, and supping on the back of a whale in mid-ocean. Some set out in boats without oars, putting their destination completely in the hands of God. Many of the exiles found their way to continental Europe, where they were more than a match for the barbarians they met. They, whom the Romans had never conquered, fearlessly brought the ancient civilization back to its ancient home. And that is how the Irish saved civilization. So thanks for watching that. I'm sitting here editing that video, which by the way, I do change my clothes. This is just happens to be the same shirt as I was wearing last week when I recorded. But um, it was a little bit of a different style. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please comment if you like that style compared to say my normal style. If you prefer it, um, please let me know that. If you like it less, um, don't let me know. No, you can let me know, that's fine. I will allow you to let me know, but you can do so in a way that's nice and that doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, hoping to do some some more kind of stuff like that on this channel. If you would like another video as well, uh, the YouTube algorithm believes that this next one is the right one for you. Thanks so much.